So the Bionic Voice project started in 2006 and it was designed to help people who'd had a laryngectomy, that is the surgical removal of some or all of their vocal cords, to regain the power of speech. So when a normal speaking person speaks, the sound starts by air expelled from the lungs, rising up through the trachea, going past the glottis of the vocal cords, which is pulled taut and, and vibrates. So the more taut it is, the higher the pitch. Um, and this is normally controlled involuntary, so you don't really think about it, but it's being changed many times per second as you produce speech. It changes the pitch in speech, high pitch to low pitch. That um, pitch signal then rises past the glottis and goes through the vocal tract and it comes out through the mouth and the nose. And the other articulators of speech, like the jaw, the tongue, the teeth, the vellum at the back of the, the nasal passage, and the nose, these all are articulated, they, they changed as we speak in order to create the sounds that are used in speech. So the big advance that we made is we observed that the source filter model which was developed by Fant in the 1960s and which underpins all speech communication systems in the real world, all speech communications technology. The source filter model, inside a computer, it divides the speech into the components that are used to create it. So, to put this simply, if we have the lung exhalation, the glottis signal for pitch, and the vocal tract, which changes the performance or the frequencies of speech, then these three components are also used inside a computer to model speech. So a human being creates speech without thinking by modulating these three components. Inside the computer that receives your speech, that speech is ripped apart into those same three components. These components are compressed they're sent to the other end, like in a vo voice call or in a voice recording. They're decompressed and the three components are used to recreate speech. Now when somebody's got speech loss, when there's a patient that is unable to speak, often just one of these different parts of the speech production mechanism is affected. So for example, if you have a laryngectomy, it's just the pitch production mechanism. If you have tongue surgery, it's just the vocal tract modulation of your tongue that's affected. All the other parts of the speech production mechanism work perfectly. So then we think, well, if a particular person has got all of the mechanisms for speech all working perfectly, but just one component is damaged, then inside a computer that speech is ripped apart into all those components. We can keep the good components, we can keep the working bits, but that one bit that's damaged can we use a computer program to recreate this? That's the Bionic Voice Project. So for people who have a laryngectomy, um, up to now, generally they have a tracheoesophageal puncture or they might have an electrolarynx in order to regain the power of speech. And these techniques work reasonably well. They're about 30 to 40 years old. They are mechanical means of adding pitch back into the speech so that larynx is gone, a person can't produce pitch themselves, so this mechanical vibrating device or a valve which vibrates, it introduces the pitch back into their speech. So we said well let's just do that by computer. Let's have a computer recreate the pitch. And there's three main ways of doing it. The first way was, as I described it, for speech communication when we rip the speech into these different components, we just create an artificial pitch signal for those people who can't create it by themselves. And this, this creates sort of computer-sounding voice. It works okay for simple sounds like ah, e, u. But the problem is, how do we know if somebody can't produce pitch? How do we know that they're trying to produce pitch? So we have to use computer models to try to predict from their speaking patterns what they're trying to say. It's actually quite difficult. It doesn't work well in the real world, especially if you're in a noisy environment. Or if you're speaking and then somebody nearby is speaking also. The second method we used was to use, like many people, 
AI techniques and AI techniques in particular we have a target which is somebody speaking sentences and then we have the speech that we want to change which is a um, maybe a voice impaired person speaking the same sentences and we can train a computer model to map from the target to the actual speech so for example your target could be, for me, it could be, say, Sean Connery speaking a sentence in his very nice voice, and me speaking it with my speech-impaired voice. We can train a machine learning model to take my degraded voice and map it into Sean Connery's. And we can do it in the lab, but you need a supercomputer, something like this, running maybe... 20 hours of computing time to process a minute or two of speech and what's more it only really works if I say the same things as Sean Connery if I say something that he's never said if I speak some phonemes that he doesn't use then these systems tend to get very confused they're also quite slow so it might be that I speak something, it might take a little while for that speech to come out of a computer. Anyway, we only do it in the lab at the moment. Eventually, maybe it could be miniaturized and used in the real world, but it's quite far away. So we searched for several years to find an alternative, a midway point between these very high quality but unrealistic machine learning models, the AI, and then the speech communication models that I said give you very robot-like artificial speech. And we did this using something called GFM IAIF, which is the glottal flow model for decomposing speech. So instead of using the 1960s FANT model, the speech production model that's used in a lot of speech communication systems, we created a, a more realistic um, a more accurate model of the vocal production mechanism. And we can model people's speech very accurately with this. It works in real time and it works in the real world. And then looking at the components of that person's speech, we can start to model those components which are missing. And we're doing that with a realistic method. So we're not trying to guess what that person was saying, we're trying to produce something that's plausibly could be what they're trying to say. And the idea is that that's under the control of the speaker. So the speaker can change their speech patterns to adjust how the system recreates speech for them. So this is the system. You can see some videos on my Bionic Voice webpage. It's being tested with some voice loss patients at the moment in New Zealand. It's at the first stage. It's about this big. We need to make it about this big. We need to make it inexpensive and we need to improve the quality. But the research is ongoing and for the first time in many years we have some hope that we will we'll be creating a system that can actually be used in the real world by voice loss patients to empower them with the ability to speak natural sounding speech again, at will, wherever they are.